Okay, yes, good, good morning. Um, I'm giving a talk today about yeah, how you can use B-splines for flexible and robust multi-ray time stepping. Um, and the main idea here is basically how you can connect two solvers that maybe want to use different time step sizes um, within your coupling time window. And at the same time, you of course don't want to break this black box assumption because then you get yeah, trouble with precise and you have to look deep into your solver. And so that's basically what yeah, what kind of idea we are we are following here. Um, and let's maybe first start with yeah, with a small example. So there's a nice yeah, paper that we found recently um, about a multi-physics modeling framework for inductive inductively coupled plasma wind tunnels. Um, and yeah, we were wondering for quite a while what is a plasma wind tunnel. Um, so one thing I found out, you need this obviously for um, yeah, for designing heat shields for these um, spacecrafts because in this plasma wind tunnel basically you have the, uh, yeah, the same conditions like when you are on re-entry and then if you want to develop this material you need something like this. Okay, um, the interesting thing from the precise side is that they uh, used different solvers for um, developing this framework for the plasma wind tunnel so they have an electromagnetic solver which is called flux, they have a fluid solver which is called Hegel, they have a material response solver which is called Pato and there's also Plato but unfortunately I did not really find out what, what they are doing with Plato so let's just yeah, take care of the three solvers and the uh, yeah, interesting thing for me here in this, in this setup is that all solvers live on different time scales. So um, with the small Delta T, I always denote the time step size of the individual solvers. And with the capital Delta T, I always denote the time window size of precise. So this is what you define in your precise config, um, how often you want to, um, to synchronize your solvers, basically. Um, and the interesting thing is here that the electromagnetic solver has the largest time step size, so it lives on the, on the coarsest scale. Then you have the fluid solver, which lives somewhere in between. And then you have the, uh, yeah, the material response solver, which is on the smallest time scale. And in this paper, they are, they are coupling them somehow. So they are using basically precise to first couple this Pato and Tegel solver. So they couple every time window, but one solver does many, uh, yeah, many steps within one time window and the other solver only does one step. And yeah, what I denoted here with the three question marks is actually the third solver does not even communicate with precise every time window, but only every 10 time windows. So I'm not sure whether this will work with, uh, yeah, with quasi-Newton, how we are doing it. Um, but the interesting thing about this whole setup is really that they obviously need three different time scales. They don't want to yeah, invest the smallest time step size on uh, all three solvers, because this would be one very costly solution, which should work, but yeah, it's very expensive. And for this, we are trying to find a solution inside Precise. So what are we currently doing here in Precise? So our um, idea is basically, if we have here on the left, basically we do one time step, uh, one time window, sorry. So we go from some initial time to initial time plus time window size. And let's say you have a Dirichlet solver on the left, which is in blue, and it does two time steps. So you see we do one time step, two time steps and the Neumann solver maybe does five time steps. And currently you can already do smaller time steps and precise will take care that in the end you are able to synchronize. But the problem is that you actually only exchange the value at the very end of the time window. So if you think about, for example, fluid structure interaction, during one time window it looks for the fluid solver like if the um, solid was frozen. Okay, so that's the, the important thing. So the Solid only moves from one time window to the next, but basically what's happening within the time window you are completely ignoring. Um, so over the last years, uh, we, we therefore studied an approach which is called waveform iteration. So the idea here is that you don't exchange at the end of the window always just one constant value, but instead of that you basically exchange functions. And what we are doing is we yeah, construct some beast plans from the data that you get in between. Um, and that's of course, yeah, nice and smooth and you have more details and yeah, our, our hope is that this um, also helps us with respect to numerics and so on. 
And yeah, on the next slides, I, I want to show you some, some results from the past years where we evaluated this approach and then I show you um, some more details on the current state of implementation. Good, so my uh, very, very simple test case that I'm using, um, I've been using in, in a paper recently, is this uh, oscillator test case where you basically have two masses, mass one and mass two. They are coupled with one spring and then you just take this very simple case and you cut the spring in the middle. And um, this gives you a very, very simple example where you can evaluate things like, for example, higher order time stepping schemes and it's also super easy to implement and because you have an analytical solution, you can also evaluate whether you are breaking things or not. Um, more details about this case will follow in the afternoon in the talk by Leonard, so I don't want to discuss the modeling and everything here. Um, I just want to show you some results. So this is what we studied first, like we looked at energy conservation. Um, what you see on the top are basically here different coupling schemes. And here you see different time stepping schemes. So all these time stepping schemes are energy conserving. And then we plotted here basically the, the trajectory of the system where the masses are traveling on. And um, yeah, if you want to keep it very simple, like if the trajectory stays on this, on this dashed line, everything is good because this means the system is conserving energy. And if this trajectory is growing, like here or here, this is bad because your energy is growing and yeah, this shouldn't happen in this kind of setup. And yeah, what we saw is actually all different coupling schemes, like they have some complicated interplay with the time stepping schemes, so you, you get in trouble. Um, in the beginning, I said, yeah, we want something which is flexible and robust. If you have to take care about your coupling scheme and the time stepping scheme, that this works together. Um, that's, yeah, at least not, not very user friendly. Um, and so we found out, okay, with waveform relaxation, actually this works nicely if you do the sampling, of course, at the right places in time. Good. Um, more details uh, yeah, are found in, in this paper here. Um, a second thing we also checked in this paper is basically how do we um, yeah, deal with higher order time stepping schemes. So what we did here is we basically just exchanged a linear interpolation over the time window. And then we looked at different time stepping schemes. So like implicit Euler, generalized alpha, explicit Runge Kutta 4. And here we also saw that with linear interpolation we can reach second order. Um, you also see that like the blue boxes are explicit Runge Kutta 4. This also drops down to second order, but this is not a reason, um, or this is not caused by the waveform relaxation on its own, but really because you're only doing linear interpolation. We will see later also an example where we get fourth order with Runge Kutta 4. Um, but overall, this is, let's say, our, our study of this approach, waveform relaxation, outside of precise. So we didn't start to implement it because, yeah, it's complicated and we wanted to, to know whether it's working well first. And yeah, after, after these results, we thought, okay, looks like a good idea. And then we started implementing this. Um, so this is basically our version one approach we had in precise. So just exchanging constant functions. This is what we then basically evaluated in the results of the paper I just showed you. This is also already released with precise version 2.4 for parallel coupling. And yeah, due to some technicalities, we only released this for serial coupling um, in the version three. Um, this is mainly yeah, related to initialization of data. Um, and what I'm currently developing is basically that you can also exchange the samples in between and that you can do something like piecewise linear interpolation or even here something like a piece plan interpolation. Good. Then let's look how, how these two approaches here perform. So again, um, ah, first I have to quickly explain maybe a bit more about subcycling. So I already explained to you this capital delta T is the, um, is the time window size. And the time step size with the small delta t, this is um, yeah, always smaller than the time window size. And what I usually do is I use evenly spaced sub-steps within the time window. So I have n of these time steps in the time window. Um, the nice thing is if we uh, want to create these blinds, then we can just use several of these sub-cycling steps within the time window. And then we have something which is better than linear interpolation. The restriction that we put up to not get into trouble is that we really only use the data from within one time window 
because yeah, you might know from yeah, multi-step methods and time-stepping, if you don't know how to start or if you don't have data from the past, you get into trouble. And therefore, we decided, okay, we only concentrate on the current time window and we can only construct a piece plan if there are enough samples within the window. Um, from our perspective, this is not a big restriction because you can always fix this. So let's say you are, like I, I show it here at the bottom, in a setup where you want to do a time window size of one second. You don't want to do any subcycling, of course, then you don't have enough data within one window to construct a piece plan. But then if you say, okay, we just go for a larger window and we say maybe our window size is four seconds and then we use some subcycling here, again, we have enough samples to create a piece plan. So this is basically our, our workaround about this restriction with the data initialization here. Um, what's important, we don't enforce any continuity conditions here, so this is really only C0 continuous and not smooth or whatever. Um, finally, one important thing about this whole subcycling is also we have another paper where we study how quasi-Newton iterations and the subcycling, how this interact. Like, I don't want to go into the details here, it's just important to to keep this in mind, so there is a small influence, but from our perspective, it's it's okay. So you gain something by using the subcycling because you have to synchronize less often, and of course, this comes with a cost, but this is uh, not not too big. Okay, then let's briefly look at some results. So here I'm comparing this version 2.4 and version 3 approach. So version 2.4 is again just constant or linear interpolation within one time window. Version 3 is you use the samples in between and you do some piece blinds or piecewise linear interpolation. And here the first idea is we have a time window size that we decrease in the sense of a conversion study and we always do four sub-steps within this time window. Um, and here we now just check, okay, is high order interpolation working? And the nice thing is, yes, uh, it is working, so we are always doing Runge Kutta 4. And we see with the, with the dashed lines, uh, we only reach first or second order. And if we go for, for piece plans that we construct out of subcycling, our Runge Kutta 4 works. Um, ah, what I forgot to mention, the important thing here is we are still yeah, dealing with this very, very simple oscillator case. So just two masses, spring, and so on. Okay. Um, the next interesting question is maybe what if we keep the time window size constant, but now we decrease the time step size. So this means we start with four samples in, win in one window, then we go to eight, 16, and so on. Um, in version 2.4, so Again, just one linear interpolation over the whole window. We don't see any improvement because we uh, we are ignoring all the subsamples. So this this makes sense. Like we have more detail within the time window, but we throw it away, so we don't see any improvement. Um, if we look at the approach with the subcycling, we again see that everything works nicely. So if we do piecewise linear interpolation, we get second order. If we use cubic piece plans, we get fourth order. Um, what's important here, the more you go to the left, of course, the more samples you have in your time window. And we already saw, okay, at some point in time, the piece plans become very, very expensive. Um, we are not yet sure what's the exact reason, but you definitely need some, some smarter strategy there than just pushing in 1,000 samples per time window and then, uh, yeah, hoping that this will not, yeah, bring your, bring your runtime into high regions. Um, the last result I wanted to show is maybe a, yeah, a quick sketch of a, of a possible real-world application setup. So here we are now um, imagining we have two solvers and they use different um, time-stepping schemes. So we have again our two masses. So this uh, piece of data, like this is the mass two. This is mass one in our oscillator system. This guy here uses um, a second order Hoyne time stepping scheme, and this guy uses a first order explicit Euler time stepping scheme. And now, of course, you, you don't want to break the order of either of the two solvers because probably you invested a lot of time to develop your, I don't know, higher order CFD solver, and then if it suddenly drops down to second order because your structure solver is not good enough, then yeah, that's that's a bit a waste of a waste of work. Um, so our idea here was to basically compensate for the lower order of the 
one solver by using smaller time steps when you um, yeah, reduce the time steps of the other solver so that you can kind of match the error of both solvers. Um, so let's, let's see how the order develops here. So we have our second order time stepping scheme and we half the time step size. And we have our first order time stepping scheme and we take a quarter of the time step size. And if we do this all the way, it looks nice. So we um, don't break the order and they, they both match nicely. Um, here again, we reach the point that we have very, very many sub-steps within one time window. So there we again run into performance issues. Therefore, we did not continue this line further to the left. Um, maybe as a small kind of sanity check, what happens if we don't follow the strategy? So if we just half the time step size for every single yeah, experiment, then we see the first order solver is a bit better because it benefits from the second order solver on the other side. Um, but the second order solver slowly levels off towards first order. And this also makes sense because the error of the first order solver at some point dominates and then you lose the high order. Okay, um, that's basically it with the results. So I now come to the conclusion. So um, yeah, I quickly summarized the, the state of the development in precise of this whole approach. So our goal is definitely to finalize this implementation and bring it into version three that we can release it. Like there are still some, some issues that we have to solve, but the overall approach is working and we have also like an experimental version in precise. Um, if you want to try this experimental version, there's a pull request. Um, you can check it out on your own. You don't have to talk to me, but of course you can also talk to me because I think, yeah, the, the pull request is a bit risky if you use it on your own. Um, but this would also be very nice because of course you can also influence how we are developing this feature and yeah, getting user feedback early here is probably very useful. Um, what's important is the restriction that I told you, you can only do the higher order um, interpolation if you also do subcycling because otherwise you just don't have enough samples within the window. Um, places where at the current state you have to be careful with the piece plan interpolation if you have very many samples at some point in time it becomes slow. So this is something where we need a strategy in the future something like I don't know throwing away some samples or doing a fit or whatever. Um, and so far we only tested this for a very simple test case so for this mass spring system, um, but we also in the quasi Newton paper that I referenced previously, and we also did a FSI test case with a second order uh, time stepping scheme. Um, then there are of course many, many questions, um, like always. Um, so one question is of course we have, when we use subcycling, um, we have to synchronize less often because we can, for example, do very large windows and very, very many sub steps. So how do you do you balance this? Because you have to synchronize your two solvers less often. This might give you a gain in parallel performance, but on the other hand, you might have to pay something for the quasi-Newton solver. So this is probably an interesting question. And then of course, are these quasi-Newton iterations harmful? And finally, um, I, I put this there, the last point I put here yesterday because we heard adaptivity in the yeah, workshop very, very often, I think. Um, so yesterday we also had this nice talk about ice sheet modeling, like there was this idea that you do a coarser resolution in winter and a finer resolution in summer, so things like this would be possible. Um, but one thing, uh, yeah, I, I also learned at the, at, the lunch uh, at, the, at the dinner is obviously with quasi-Newton, if you don't have evenly spaced um, samples in time, this might be a problem. So we didn't look at this so far like our samples were only evenly spaced and with quasi-Newton and non-evenly spaced samples, that's currently also an open question. Good, then final slide. Um, later at the World Cafe, um, yeah, we also have a table on time stepping. So if you have some, some crazy applications with spacecrafts or whatever, um, which is fitting in this kind of direction, then yeah, it would be nice to talk to you. So. Interesting for us is always which kind of time stepping schemes are you using? Are they high order? Do you have some yeah, huge differences in scales for your solvers? And maybe also what kind of interpolation would you require? Like, do you need the fully resolved 1,000 uh, 1, subsamples B spline, or would it be fine to do something like a linear fit or whatever? Like, we we are there very yeah, interested in your in your crazy ideas. 
Okay, then that's it, and I'm yeah, looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah. I was wondering if you have any insight into why the piece binds become expensive when the time window is large. Yeah, we, we didn't look very closely at this yet. So I did not do very detailed performance measurements. Like I just ran this conversion study and I found out, okay, when we have 1,000 sub, uh, sub steps, then it yeah, just takes forever. So on, on my laptop, maybe this is also important to say, like all these experiments are, are done on my laptop, so I don't want to yeah, stress a HPC cluster with mass spring examples. Any other questions? Um, yeah, so this, this was one of the main questions we tried to, to answer in this, uh, yeah, in this paper where we investigated the quasi Newton. So, wait, I, ha, I have a backup slide. Um, so, there we uh, defined different uh, yeah, funny, funny abbreviations for quasi Newton schemes. So, what we have here is this reduced quasi Newton waveform iteration. This means basically you only use the very last sample in your time window. So, with respect to quasi Newton, you still just throw everything away. You only take care of the last sample. Um, but of course, you have many degrees of freedom. You can use all the samples. You can, I don't know, apply some filtering. We did not do this. Um, but in the paper, we found out that this reduced approach where you only use the last sample, like this is comparable and good enough. And for us, currently also easier to implement. Any other questions? Uh, if not, I have one, maybe. I missed it earlier with this slide here, this only C0 continuous. Uh, ah, yeah, you yeah. could have stayed there, yeah. Um, could you not maybe just fit a spline through at least the current time window and the previous time window, at, at least to get some sort of uh, continuous solution there? Because maybe the, with the subcycling for your other solver, its time step is just, just past the the time window there at mm -hmm. four seconds, and then you will get quite a different interpolation solution there. Did you try that, or is it not worth it? Uh, we, we did not try it, and yeah, I, I guess you could probably enforce continuity here, like on the B-spline, like this is, I, I think, generally possible, but yeah, it's also, again, a question of implementation. How do you configure this? How do you let the user decide what kind of continuity do you want? And yeah, like we, we did not really check on this question yet whether the continuity really is harmful or not. Um, I think in the quasi-Newton paper, yeah, we did one small experiment on this and there we found out, okay, it's, it's not a big problem because of course usually you don't have these heavy, heavy kinks like illustrated here. Um, but yeah, like we also did not find any, any visible defects there, so. Probably it's good very, enough for very now. problem dependent. Hmm? Probably very problem dependent. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. All right. Any last questions? We have plenty of time, so don't be scared. No. Yes. So yeah, you have this in this on on only the, the two masses to the springs, or do you use it also for the application of the uh, shear? Um, so, with with the heat shield, I, I have I have nothing to do. I, I just picked the spacecraft because it's a, a nice example. Um, so, basically, I started with a I, I think with some FSI case. This was too complicated. I couldn't see any errors, so I went to a yeah, partitioned heat equation. This is something we also discussed in yeah, in the quasi Newton paper as an example for a yeah, partial differential equation. Um, this oscillator problem, this is nice for energy conservation and stuff like this. 
And yeah, we also did in the precise tutorials, there's this perpendicular flap test case like that we checked with a second order time stepping scheme in this quasi Newton paper. And yeah, of course, in the end, the goal when the implementation in precise is ready uh, is to apply this to a yeah, more, more realistic case. So maybe to some of the tutorials or even something, something nicer. Um, but yeah, we first had to, yeah, to evaluate it on simple test cases and then move it inside precise that you don't have to somehow do all the implementation around precise and yeah. So that was, let's say, the, the rough strategy on test cases and yeah. Does, does this answer the question or was it? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then when you integrate on the time step, it's a bit different when you want to do self-cycling. So have you thought maybe about applying that for stochastic equation? Uh, not, not, not so far. <laughs> um, but, but maybe what... Uh, Maybe it's a good point to, to say this again. So this kind of idea, this is already available in precise. So you can uh, use this. So I explained this last year at the, at the precise workshop, so how the API and so on works. So this is maybe a, a good idea if you have a fitting application to already try it now without having to, to deal with my crazy pull request. Um, because this already gives you some of the nice features that you have this kind of continuous approximation and not these jumps. All right, I think if there's no more questions, thank you, Benny, for your talk. And